Welcome everyone to the um, RBA's Economic Update webinar for Year 12 students. My name's Jackie Dwyer and I head the Public Education Program at the RBA and I'll be your host for the webinar this afternoon. Now I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we each meet today. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with us. We're coming to you from the bank's head office in Gadigal country. Now, the main presentation today will be given by one of our economists, John Bolter, who will provide um, an overview of monetary policy and a summary of current economic conditions. Now, throughout John's talk, we encourage you to submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box. We get lots of questions, especially at this time of year, and we won't be able to cover them all, but we will cover the key themes. Now, if you submit your questions in the Q&A box as they arise, that will increase the chance that we can answer your question when our Q&A session begins. Now, following John's um, presentation, we're fortunate to have the bank's chief economist, Lucy Ellis, also uh, joining us. But I'll now hand over uh, to our presenter, John, who will tell us just a little bit about himself and then um, proceed with his presentation. So welcome, John. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. Thanks very much for, uh, for joining us today. Um, my name is John Bolter. I'm an economist in um, economic in analysis department of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Um, and I'm in a section called Dom domestic activity and trade. Um, where we kind of look at um, developments in the real side of the economy. So you would have seen, I'm sure you would have learned about um, your Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX. Um, so we're really looking at all those different components. So we've got um, someone looking at consumption um, or a couple of people looking at consumption, someone looking at imports, someone looking at exports, um, someone looking at dwelling investment, um, someone looking at business investment and so on. Um, so that's... Uh, where I work, um, and before this, I was in our um, in our China office, which you may or may not be aware uh, we have, where I was monitoring developments in um, in the Chinese economy, and that's uh, based out of Beijing in China. Um, so, onto the presentation. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about the functions of the RBA. Um, so the RBA is known mainly for its monetary policy decisions and its operations in financial markets um, to implement those um, decisions. Um, and that's what I'll focus on today. Uh, but I just do want to point out first that the RBA does a lot more than this. Um, for instance, uh, we design and print Australia's banknotes. Uh, we oversee the payment system uh, to ensure payments are safe, efficient and competitive. Um, and we're also the Australian government's banker. Um, so, for example, when the government made JobKeeper payments through the pandemic, the RBA processed them, um, and we process over um, 300 million payments on behalf of government uh, agencies each year. Uh, the RBA, along with a few other government agencies, also has a responsibility to maintain the stability of the financial system. Um, and so we have a financial stability department that's constantly scanning the Australian and um, global financial systems, um, particularly banks for emerging risks. So what guides how the RBA goes about these activities? Um, well, first of all, the RBA is not a commercial bank. Um, it's ho owned wholly by the government. Um, so where a typical bank tries to maximise profits for its shareholders, um, the RBA's objectives um, are to ensure three things. First, the stability of the currency. So having a stable currency means that the value of money um, and what you can purchase with it doesn't change too much or too quickly over time. Uh, the second is full employment, um, which strives to ensure that the economy can provide enough work for all Australians that choose to have a job um, are qualified and available to work. So that doesn't mean unemployment will uh, be zero or we're even aiming for zero. Um, there's some types of unemployment that uh, monetary policy can't influence. Um, for example, the unemployment that, um, that occurs when people move between jobs or they're not qualified for the jobs that, that need filling. Uh, and the third objective of monetary policy is the economic prosperity and welfare of the Australian people. 
So that relates to the other two objectives, um, because if inflation is low and stable and everyone who wants to work is doing so, then people are generally better off. Um, and when the Reserve Bank Board uh, uh, sets monetary policy, um, it strives to meet those, those three objectives. Um, so let's see how the, uh, the, the board does that in practice. So the primary way the RBA um, seeks to achieve these objectives is by achieving an inflation target, uh, inflation rate of two to three percent per year on average over the medium term. So inflation is simply the increase in prices of things that you or I um, spend money on, food, clothing, um, entertainment, transport, childcare, health and housing. Um, if inflation rises too quickly, um, it makes it difficult for businesses and households to make um, to make their savings and investment decisions. Um, and if inflation rises more than uh, by more than households' incomes, then they're worse off because they can buy less goods and services than they were able to before. So the RBA doesn't uh, does not try to keep inflation between two and three percent. Uh, so it doesn't always try to keep inflation exactly between two and three percent, as illustrated simply here. Um, inflation is sometimes a bit above and sometimes a bit below the inflation target, um, but that's okay. Um, but over the medium term, we can't, We want inflation to average between uh, two and 3%. So how does the RBA influence inflation? Uh, this gra graph shows it uh, very simply. Um, the straight line represents uh, kind of potential economic output. It's kind of how much, it's what we think of as how, how the economy would perform if all resources are used at their normal levels. Um, and you can think of it as kind of like a speed limit for the economy. So when the economy is growing faster than this speed limit, um, it's not sustainable. There's too much demand for goods and services and this push, pushes up prices, that is inflation rises. Um, if inflation looks like it will not be consistent with the RBA inflation target, um, the RBA will want to slow the economy down back to a normal speed. Um, now, what would the RBA do if the economy is running above its potential and inflation is too high? Um, well, we'd tighten monetary policy and increase interest rates. Conversely, when the economy is below its potential or growing slower than its speed limit, um, as was the case due to the economic damage caused by COVID-19, then the RBA will want to give the economy a bit of a boost um, to prevent unemployment rising and, and uh, increase inflation. So in this instance, uh, the RBA will want to loosen monetary policy um, and it'll do that by decreasing interest rates. So how does that work in practice? Uh, the main way uh, the RBA board sets monetary policy is through a target for this for Australia's official interest rate, which is the cash rate. The RBA can also use other monetary policy tools uh, to influence interest rates, um, which happened through the COVID period. Um, as, and that's especially useful when the cash rate is, is very low and can't be uh, lowered much further. The cash rate and the interest rates affected by uh, the RBA's other monetary policy tools are a reference point for other interest rates in the economy, um, such as um, those that people uh, pay when they're borrowing for a house uh, and also those received from their deposits held in bank accounts. So as a result, changes in monetary policy tends to flow through to changes in um, those interest rates, which affect people's decisions. So changes in these interest rates affect total spending in the economy um, and therefore economic growth, employment and inflation. Um, so let's consider the case where the RBA lowers the interest rates. Uh, in this case, um, people don't get as much interest from saving their money, so they're more likely to spend it. It becomes cheaper for businesses to borrow to invest, for example, um, borrowing to buy better machines. Um, and on loan repayments, um, for example, on, um, on house mortgages, uh, they become smaller. So the repayments become smaller, which gives people more, more money to, to spend on other things. Um, and they're just some of the, there, there are some other ways, but you, you kind of get the idea. Um, the boost to spending um, increases aggregate demand, leading to higher economic growth, uh, more employment, and ultimately higher inflation. So the challenge for the RBA is that these things um, don't just happen uh, instantaneously, they happen very slowly. So households and businesses don't change their behavior overnight. 
Uh, in fact, the effect of changes in interest rates might not completely flow through to the economy for up to uh, one to two years. Um, so often, um, the RBA has to has to be forward looking and make forecasts about the um, the economy, how the economy will be performing in the future. Um, and that's why we create a, a full set of forecasts every quarter, which we um, release in our statement on monetary policy. Uh, so I'd like to now turn to current economic conditions. So that's the kind of framework. Um, so let's talk about um, the current economic conditions. Um, we'll start by talking about the global economy. So you may have been hearing in the news recently that inflation is high at the moment. Um, in fact, it's been at multi-decade highs in most economies over recent months and well above many central banks' inflation targets. Inflation has also been broad-based based across a wide range of goods and services and more persistent than most economists expected. We can see that in this graph, um, that headline inflation on a monthly basis has been consistently higher than core inflation recently. Um, as food and energy prices have risen, reflecting major disruptions to global supply um, due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That said, um, core or underlying inflation, which uh, excludes more volatile energy and food prices, also remains uh, quite high in many economies and is yet to show signs of easing. So what's, uh, what's driving this increase in core inflation? This graph shows core inflation split into goods and services. Um, you can see that while goods inflation, which is shown in blue, um, initially drove the increase in overall inflation, um, high core inflation now reflects um, rising services inflation, shown in the orange line, offsetting a gradual moderation in goods inflation in, in some economies. Uh, inflation for many types of services has increased amid a uh, recovery in the demand for services, faster wages growth and increasing prices for commodities used as inputs such as food and fuel. Uh, disruptions to supply chains have accounted for much of the increase in inflation globally over the past year. So this graph shows some of the indicators that RBA looks at to assess supply chain pressures. Um, these indicators have continued to ease over recent, uh, recent months, but still remain quite high. Um, and importantly, an easing of global supply constraints, if sustained, um, should reduce the pressure on inflation over the coming year. So after rising strongly for many months, the prices of certain agricultural products and inputs have fallen noticeably recently to be back at their levels at the beginning of the year. So this is particularly evident in the top two panels of, of this, this chart. Um, the price of oil shown in the red line uh, in this graph here, um, and which is a major input into many sectors of the economy, um, has declined quite a lot since mid-June as economists um, uh, as economists expect that global economic growth is um, going to slow. Wheat prices uh, shown in orange have also fallen below their recent peak as favorable, favorable weather conditions um, have raised expectations for harvest in the Northern hemisphere in anticipation of the resumption of Ukrainian and Russian grain exports. Um, the, the decline in both oil and food prices, if sustained, is likely to reduce the pressure on headline inflation over the coming months. So what households and businesses expect inflation to do in the future also plays an important role in determining the rate of inflation. Um, and that's because inflation expectations can affect households and business, businesses' wage negotiations and price setting behavior, which can influence actual inflation outcomes. So in this graph, we can see that um, households' inflation expectations for the year ahead in two of the largest advanced economies, uh, the US and the UK, um, have increased sharply in response to uh, recent high inflation outcomes and are now at their highest level since the early 1980s. Um, household expectations for inflation in the medium term have also increased, uh, but they remain much lower than short term expectations. So this indicates that households expect inflation to moderate substantially to ranges broadly consistent with central bank targets. Um, other measures of inflation expectations, such as from financial markets, show a similar trend across a number of countries. <clears throat> 
um, to address high inflation and the risk of uh, of these kind of um, this being entrenched in longer term inflation expectations, central banks in most economies have in increased their policy rates in recent months. The increases in policy rates have been relatively rapid compared with the past. Uh, most of these central banks have continued to have continued to gradually reduce their holdings of assets purchased under the quantitative uh, under quantitative easing programs. Um, central banks in most advanced economies have signaled that uh, further policy rate increases are likely to be needed in the near term to return inflation to target levels. Um, looking at this graph, financial market participants expect policy rates will peak earlier than, uh, than we expected at the, the May statement on monetary policy. Um, so while we can see, um, so well, as we can see in this graph, um, wages growth has picked up in many economies uh, alongside very low unemployment rates. Wages growth is still quite a bit lower than inflation, and that means that wages have declined in real terms. So this uh, reduction in household purchasing power in combination with tighter monetary policy um, is expected to weigh on household consumption. And because of this, global economic growth is now expected to be markedly lower over the coming years. Uh, this is particularly the case for the US, uh, shown in the first panel of this graph, where growth forecasts for both 2022 and 2023 have been downgraded by one and a half uh, percentage points since, since May. Um, we can see that uh, this in the difference between the blue dots, um, the previous forecast for growth uh, and the pink bars, which are the current forecasts uh, for growth. So the outlook for global growth is quite uncertain at the moment. Um, some of the questions that forecasters are grappling with are, um, will high, high inflation become even more persistent than expected, requiring a larger monetary policy response? Um, how will household spending respond to the decline in real disposable income from high inflation and tighter monetary policy? Uh, and could we see further adverse shocks to the supply of goods? Um, yeah, this might be in the way of additional disruptions to the supply of energy or food commodities for Russia and Ukraine if conflict in the region was to, uh, was to escalate. Um, now let's turn to the domestic economy. Um, so the Australian economy was resilient to the disruption caused by uh, the Omicron outbreak of COVID-19 and the East Coast floods in um, early 2022. So the strength in the economy has been particularly evident in the labour market, where the unemployment rate has declined to 3.5% in June, uh, which is its uh, lowest level in, in nearly 50 years, um, which you can see on the blue line. So this decline in, un in the unemployment rate uh, reflects strong demand for uh, workers. Um, firms have not only hired new staff, but also increased the hours worked by, uh, by existing staff with many part-time employees shifting into full-time work. This has helped push the uh, underemployment rate, which is the purple line, uh, down to very low levels in recent months. So this fall in both unemployment and underemployment has seen overall underutilization, which is the sum of the blue and purple lines, decline to its low, lowest level since 1982. Both Omicron as well as the flooding on the east coast of Australia affected people's ability to go to work. Um, so this graph shows the number of people employed in purple, total hours worked across the economy in orange, and average hours worked per, per employee in green. Um, so, and this is shown in index form where the, where the March quarter of 2012 is equal to 100. So you can see that the labor market adjusted to this uh, illness and weather, uh, to these illness and weather related disruptions, mostly through a decline in hours worked. That is the orange line declined more than the purple line um, and hence the average hours worked per employee declined. Overall, um, the disruptions caused by higher than usual levels of illness have been um, more persistent than expected a few months ago. Uh, the number of job vacancies that firms are trying to fill, um, a useful indicator of labour demand, uh, are at historically higher levels amongst, uh, across most industries. 
including those that rely heavily on migrants for their workforce, um, such as in hospitality. Although permanent and long-term migration flows have largely returned to pre-pandemic levels, um, arrivals of students and working holiday makers um, remain quite a bit lower than uh, before the pandemic. Looking at the blue vacancies to unemployment line in this graph, uh, we can see that there are actually nearly as many job vacancies as there are people actively looking for work. So many firms are also reporting that finding suitable labour is a severe constraint on their output. So these indicators suggest we'll see further strong growth in employment over the rest of the year. The supply of labour has also increased in response to the strong demand for labour. So that is more people are choosing to um, more people are choosing to enter the labour force. Um, and the participation rate, which is the share of the population age 15 and, and over uh, who are employed or actively looking for work, um, increased to a record high of 66.8% in June. Um, the unemployment rate is forecast to decline a little further to around three and a quarter percent in late 2022, um, lower than the estimate as at um, the May S&P before rising, um, sorry, before the August S&P before rising modestly over the next couple of years um, as growth in domestic activity is expected to slow. Uh, consistent with the continued tightness of the labour market, um, economic growth is also strong. So growth in domestic demand was robust in the June quarter um, and timely indicators suggest momentum was sustained in the September quarter. So this graph shows, um, and I actually made this the original version of this graph in, in that, but um, this graph shows that the Australian economy grew by 0.9% in the June quarter. Um, and it was the first full quarter of, uh, of little activity restrictions. And so it was driven by consumption growth, which is uh, a kind of a part of that, a big part of that orange bar. Um, net exports shown by the blue bar um, also contributed to growth in the June quarter. Um, export, e exports increased, particularly of commodities, increased sharply as weather and maintenance related disruptions to production eased from the March quarter and firms drew down on inventories to meet global, you know, strong global demand. Um, imports only grew modestly, um, partly driven by Australians holidaying overseas, which is counted as, um, uh, as, uh, as imports from an Australian perspective. Um, household consumption makes up around half of GDP and, and has been the main driver of the large fluctuations in GDP over the past couple of years. So the top panel of this graph uh, shows the level of nominal household consumption um, and household disposable uh, income. The share of disposable income which households don't consume each quarter, known as the saving ratio, is shown in the bottom panel. Um, the lines to the left of the vertical line are actual outcomes and the lines to the right are forecasts. Um, but I should point out here that um, these are forecasts from our August statement on monetary policy, um, and we have updated data since then. Um, and the saving ratio um, on the bottom panel has actually come down to 8.7% in the June quarter, which is still higher than pre-pandemic levels, um, but you know, starting to approach those um, pre-pandemic levels. Um, consumption led the increase in economic growth in the first half of the year um, as spending on discretionary goods and services, including travel and hospitality, continued to recover from prior COVID-19 restrictions um, and the full reopening of the international border. So the resilience in consumption partly reflects strong growth in disposable income, uh, which continues to be supported by strong labour market conditions. Uh, at present, household incomes are being supported by strong labour demand and household balance sheets are, in gen are generally in pretty good shape, uh, underpinned by a high level of savings. Uh, but further out, growth in consumption is uh, forecast to moderate as rising prices, uh, high interest rates uh, and high interest rates weigh on real disposable income growth. Household consumption can also be dampened by uh, wealth effects um, as housing and other asset prices decline. The domestic economy is expected to grow strongly um, over the rest of 2022 as household consumption is supported by strong labor income, labor income growth uh, and education and travel services exports uh, pick back up. But there are headwinds to growth um, and those headwinds 
uh, are expected to cause GDP growth to slow in 2023 and 2024. So partly that's um, household budgets coming under increasing pressure from rising prices, particularly for food and energy and high interest rates. Um, consumer sentiment has deteriorated uh, sharply since the start of the year uh, and housing prices have begun to decline alongside weaker activity in the established housing market. Um, rising interest rates and the expectation of further increases in the cash rate. So GDP is forecast to grow by around three and a quarter percent over 2022, before slowing to one and three quarters uh, of a percent over 2023 and uh, similarly in 2024. Um, these estimates are um, a bit lower than we had forecast at the um, at the time of the May S and P. Uh, wages growth has picked up as the labour market has continued to tighten. Um, the wage price index, or WPI, um, grew by around 2.5% over the year, uh, which is higher than during the height of the pandemic. So more timely information from the bank's business liaison program and other business surveys suggest that wages growth will pick up further in the year ahead alongside continued tightness in the labour market. Wage policy announcements by the Fair Work Commission, which is a, an independent Australian body responsible for setting national minimum wages and employment conditions, and a number of uh, state governments are also expected to um, support a pickup in wages growth in the period ahead. Growth in the WPI is forecast to pick up to three and three quarters of a percent by um, end of 2024. Um, and this would be the highest uh, level of wages growth since 2012. Now, as is the case that I mentioned um, before, um, with inflation being high overseas, inflation in Australia is also high. Um, so the headline consumer price index increased by 1.8% in the June quarter uh, and by 6.1% over the year. Um, the last time year-ended CPI inflation was this high was uh, the early 1990s. Uh, and, and that was before the RBA had adopted its inflation target of 2 to 3%. So this outcome was higher than we expected a few months ago, um, largely reflecting increases in fuel, uh, fruit and vegetable prices. So this graph shows those contributions to the quarterly growth in consumer prices. You can see the prices for newly construct constructed dwellings, which make up uh, just a little under 10% of the CPI basket, uh, and is shown in blue, accounted for around one third of the increase in headline inflation in the June quarter um, because inflation in that component was, um, so, was so high. Um, this primarily, prim primarily reflected further substantial increases in the prices charged by builders in all capital cities amid sustained strong demand for housing construction. Inflation of consumer durables, uh, which includes things like household appliances, cars and clothes shown in red here in this chart, uh, continue to increase strongly over the June quarter, reflecting global supply, uh, supply chain disruptions, sustained global and domestic demand and high transport costs. Grocery prices shown in orange uh, rose further over the June quarter as supermarkets continued to pass through um, cost increases from suppliers. So grocery suppliers have faced widespread cost increases, including for things like fertilizers, chemicals, shipping, shipping and packaging. Um, adverse weather conditions, which affected the supply of certain items, um, also helped to push the prices of fruits and, and veg vegetables higher. I don't know if anyone tried to um, buy lettuce a few months ago, but it was quite expensive. Um, so while some of the cost pressures associated with high materials and transport costs uh, are showing signs of easing uh, globally, it will take some time before this flows through to the prices uh, paid by Australian consumers. Input cost pressures and strong demand uh, continue to drive strong goods inflation in the June quarter uh, and have also contributed to a pickup in services inflation in recent quarters. So while the prices of services are generally very sensitive to domestic labour costs, non-labour costs have helped to drive uh, higher prices for some services in recent quarters, especially for cafes and restaurants. Alongside he uh, high headline inflation, uh, measures of underlying inflation uh, that remove the effect of regular or temporary price changes were also very strong in the June quarter, um, reflecting broad-based price rises. 
with around three quarters of the CPI basket recording annualized price increases above 3%. Um, remember, the reason 3% is interesting is because it's the, the top of the RBA's inflation target. Grim mean inflation, uh, shown by the blue line, was 4.9% over the year and 1.5% in the quarter, which is the strongest outcome. Uh, so that 4.9% um, um, over the year was the strongest outcome in the year in the term since 1991. Uh, looking at this graph, um, headline and trim mean inflation are expected to increase further in the second half of the year, uh, with headline inflation peaking at around seven and three quarters percent um, in year-ended terms in, in, at the end of this year, uh, and around um, and we'll have growth of around six percent um, uh, to the end of 2023. Um, from early 2023, infl inflation is expected to moderate as global supply side um, problems continue to ease and commodity prices stabilise. So as these supply factors abate, um, further increases in wages in response to the low levels of unemployment um, are expected to become the main driver of inflation outcomes uh, later in the forecast period. By late 2024, um, inflation is expected to decline uh, to around the top of the two to three percent uh, inflation target range. Um, Short-term inflation expectations um, increase further over the June quarter, um, but most medium and longer-term inflation expectations remain um, anchored and consistent with the RBA's uh, inflation inflation target. Um, Cost of living pressures from rising fuel, uh, food and fuel costs are likely to fall unevenly across households and are likely to impact low income households, um, which tend to spend a larger share of the income on these necessary items and have relatively limited budgets, uh, li limited buffers of savings uh, to draw upon. Um, for some of those more vulnerable households, their real incomes will be supported by the Fair Work Commission decision and, and by increases in, in employment. So thinking back to this, um, this graph shown earlier um, and given everything that I've talked about today, so where do you think we are on the business cycle and what do you think the RBA should be doing in response? So as we've seen, uh, inflation in Australia is the highest it has been since the early 1990s. The Australian economy is expected to grow strongly this year and the labour market remains tighter than it has been for many years. Therefore, uh, the RBA has, um, has, has the responsibility, has and had the responsibility to act. Um, the board has stated that it um, places a high priority on the return of inflation to the two to three percent uh, range over time, uh, while seeking to do this in a way that keeps the economy on an even keel. So accordingly, accordingly, the board followed up the initial increase in the cash rate target of a quarter of a percentage point in May, with four increases of half a percentage point in each of the following months, taking the cap cash rate target to 2.35%. This increase towards more normal levels is required to bring inflation back to target and to create a more sustainable balance of demand and supply in the Australian economy. Um, the board expects to increase interest rates further over the months ahead. Uh, but it's not on a preset path given the uncertainties around the economic outlook. The size and timing of future interest rate um, increases will be guided by um, the incoming data and the board's assessment of the outlook for inflation in the labour market. As discussed earlier in this presentation, uh, changes in monetary policy tend to flow through to changes in borrowing and lending rates. Um, and those are the, the interest rates that actually matter for, uh, for you and me uh, for parents and businesses. Reflecting the recent increase in the cash rate target and the expected monetary policy tightening in the period ahead, interest rates paid on deposits and the cost of borrowing have both increased. So in this graph, you can see the interest rates on housing uh, and business loans are starting to increase from historical lows. That is, um, changes in monetary policy that RBA has implemented are beginning to flow through to the economy via the financial system. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, monetary policy operates with long and variable lags. So the effect of changes in interest rates might not completely flow through to the economy for up to one to two years. So getting the timing right on future increases in the cash rate isn't easy, but is crucial. 
Uh, we know that um, raising in, uh, rates too slowly or too quickly can have significant consequences for the Australian people. Um, so you might be studying this material in order to finish school, um, but I encourage you to keep thinking and engaging in these issues uh, into the future. Uh, perhaps even th perhaps even think about further study um, and maybe even a career in economics. Uh, but studying economics either way will stand you in in good stead in your in your future endeavors. Um, that wraps up our well, my talk for today. But I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks so much, John. So um, really appreciate that. Um, and there's a bit of a theme of uh, questions in relation to inflation, because it's obviously um, such a, a, a topical issue. And in fact, for a while, there was the most um, Googled word. Um, now, in, in his recent speech, the governor described um, inflation as a scourge, which was a very strong word for um, a governor to use. So could you perhaps just summarise, first of all, um, why inflation is considered so concerning for central banks? Why is it a scourge? So we might, might address that question first. Yeah, okay. So first I would say that um, inflation itself isn't a scourge. Um, you can see we want 2 to 3% in inflation. So it's actually high inflation uh, that's a scourge. Um, and the reason it's a scourge is that, you know, if you have inflation where you're not certain what it's going to be one, one period to the next and it's very high, it's very hard to make your, as a business, it's very hard to make uh, make decisions about um, when you should invest. Um, and as a consumer, it's very hard to make decisions about when you should save and when you should spend. Um, and if this inflation gets, um, yeah, and the further inflation gets out of control, the, um, the harder it is to, to make those decisions. Um, so, yeah, I would say that that's why we have a central bank focused on the inflation target. Um, because it is so difficult for all members participating in the economy when it does get get too high. Um, yeah. Th thanks, um, John. Um, students are also interested in understanding better the difference between headline and underlying inflation. And in fact, is underlying and core inflation the same thing? Because these are these are expressions I'll often read in the newspaper. Yeah, they're essentially interchangeable. So um, sometimes, yeah, and there's different measures of core or underlying inflation. So one measure that we typically use is, is trim mean inflation. Um, and what it, try, what it tries to do is um, there's some measures of inflation, or there's some components of the, the CPI basket that tend to be quite volatile, um, which is food and fuel. And so if, if in normal times, it, it, when they're quite volatile, what that means is the price might increase a lot and then the price might decrease a lot. Um, and if we kind of expect that, um, you know, these volatile items are going to increase and then decrease a lot, we kind of want to look through that, um, that excess volatility and look at kind of underlying measures of inflation. And if we do that, um, we can be certain that if, if that underlying measure of inflation is, is, is rising by more than we'd like, then we can be certain that there are some kind of um, uh, inflation pressures that aren't transitory that uh, we think are going to, um, you know, sustain a higher level of inflation over time. So that's kind of why we, um, yeah, we look at those measures of core or underlying inflation as well as the, the headline, uh, those headline measures. Thank you. Um, now, students are also asking, how does the RBA think about or measure um, the interactions between wages, growth and inflation? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, yeah, we have a number of different things that we uh, monitor. So we'll monitor um, the wage price index, which is, um, yeah, one measure. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a matched measure um, of wages. So, you know, um, in aggregate over the economy, if we're looking at the, the same um, pool of workers, um, what they get, get in one reference period compared to the next reference period. But we also look at other, other measures, measures of wages, um, uh, like conversation of employees, which is kind of like the total amount of um, 
wages accumulated by um, by employees in the, over the whole economy. Um, so we look at a lot of um, yeah different measures measures of um, of wages, and they they can all tell us some something different. Um, the national accounts we also have um, another measure of in uh, of in, of wages growth called um, AENA, which is the average average earnings for the national accounts. Um, so, so thanks, John. There's been a number of questions about um, uh, quantitative easing. Um, so, they're, they're 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 quite themed around how yep. we how we did it, and how effective we think these tools were in um, stimulating consumption and investment during the pandemic. So, can you give a a, a beginner's guide to um, to quantitative easing and and um, how effective we thought it was? Yeah, so quantitative easing is something that um, generally gets de deployed when we're at the zero lower bound and we can't uh, reduce the cash rate further. So it's an additional policy tool um, that's deployed, generally deployed in that case. Um, and what it means is um, the, the central bank purchases um, Australian government bonds with the um, intent of reducing interest rates further out along the yield curve. Um, and so it's just kind of it's a, another way of reducing um, longer term rates to further further stimulate the economy. Um, yeah, so that's a, a general general background. And in, in terms of its effectiveness, um, uh, I think I will uh, defer on that one because um, I mean we think it's effective, uh, but how effective? Um, yeah, the jury is still out, and there's still a lot of work being being done on that. And I think people were interested in the references to your work in China. Um, so uh, when you were introducing yourself, and so so there are some questions about the Chinese economy, how it's performing, and and what are the implications of that um, for Australia? Yeah, so um, we have a strong focus on the Chinese economy, at the RBA, because we're a small open economy, um, and developments in other countries really do affect us. Um, China is a huge economy. Um, it also purchases a lot of our, purchases a lot of our commodities. Um, so developments in China really um, can affect um, the Australian economy. So that's why we look at it um, so closely. Um, in terms of, yeah, recent developments. So you may have heard that um, China is going through quite a difficult time in terms of um, their zero COVID strategy. Um, which has caused um, you know, consumption growth to be more muted. Um, it's caused you know, supply chain disruptions. Um, and they're also going through um, some adjustments in their housing market. Um, and so it, there's some questions about um, how the, the, the future of the, um, the housing market in China plays out. Um, and of course the housing market demands a lot of steel, which demands a lot of iron ore, um, which Australia provides a lot of. So these are kind of developments that we're very, very um, tightly focused on. Thanks. Thanks, John. Now, there have been a few questions on the balance of payments. Um, so I think perhaps it's uh, best if you summarise, um, you know, recent trends in the balance of payments and what the key drivers of them are. Just a, a, a brief encapsulation of that would be really helpful. Um, yeah, so the current account balance, um, yeah, we look at it through the, the trade side of things and we've had um, uh, quite a, um, yeah, quite a lot of strength in the, in the current account balance, but we, we're still, um, we're expecting some, the exports of Australian goods have been actually quite a bit lower than um, than they were pre-pandemic. So we think there's some some recovery um, on the export side, um, and then we also think there's some uh, recovery on the uh, on the import side of things as um, Australians kind of go overseas more um, and demand more more services from from overseas. Um, they're the kind of things that we think about in terms of the the, the current account. Um, Okay, th thanks, thanks so much, John. Um, and as you foreshadowed, Lucy has um, has has joined us. So um, uh, 
we're, we've just had a, a really sort of clear and engaging presentation from John, um, extremely um, uh, thoughtful and relevant to the, the work of the, of the students. Um, we're also pleased that you're now joining us, Lucy. And we've, we've had so many questions that we can't address them all, but there's, there's a few ones that I think are very much for the bank's chief economist. Um, so, so before you offer your, your words of, of in, encouragement, um, we we might um, ask you if if you can talk through the with the students how how you think through the interactions between fiscal and monetary policy. This is commonly asked by by students. In fact, it's always asked when when we um, when we have major presentations. So would be would be grateful for your perspective on on that. Well, thanks, Jackie, and uh, you, uh, thanks, John, for uh, doing the presentation, and thanks to everyone uh, who's here on, on, on the webinar. Look, the way I think about the interaction between fiscal and monetary, po monetary policy is that they're both, uh, they're both policy tools that can you know, boost or detract from domestic demand, and what matters is the sectoral, initial sectoral impact that they have. So for example, when we think about monetary policy, uh, we know it affects the cash flows of people who have interest bearing debt or who have interest bearing assets such as bank deposits, uh, particularly if those um, loans and deposits are floating rate uh, rather than long-term fixed rate loans. Uh, we know it affects the exchange rate and we know it influences asset prices and people's uh, savings and investment decisions uh, over time. Whereas if you think about the role of fiscal policy. You've got both the overall impact on the economy. Uh, I mean, a very crude way to think about that is the fiscal impact, which is the change in the deficit. So when deficits are getting smaller or uh, fiscal positions are going into surplus, that tends to take demand out of the economy. And similarly, uh, when deficits are increasing, uh, that means it's adding demand into the economy. And so of course, we've recently seen a very big stimulus uh, to demand uh, from the fiscal side as a response to the pandemic. And then that's now coming back globally. Um, I think one of the other elements, uh, so it, it just they have very different distributional consequences, the channels in which they um, uh, affect people's spending decisions are quite different. And within fiscal policy, there's a, a lot of more choices about exactly how you have that that impact. You can have an aggregate impact in terms of the overall fiscal impact, but it matters whether you do that by, for example, buying goods and services uh, directly, you know, hiring more public servants or teachers. <coughs> it matters whether you do that through uh, the tax and transfer system. So whether you're, you know, cutting taxes for one group or paying higher welfare payments uh, for another group. All of those things really matter for the impact, particularly in the short run. And so you can have very powerful effects on other sectors, particularly the household sector spending decisions in the short run uh, through fiscal policy, whereas uh, monetary policy is a bit more diffuse and takes a bit longer to come through. So, so that's really the way I think about it. And, you know, it's really helpful when you see these uh, two, two arms of policy playing to their strengths, but working in the same direction to support the economy when needed. Thanks so much, Lucy. And one other question for the Chief Economist, uh, one last question, um, but, but it's, it's an important one. John's presentation has taken through um, some demand and supply side influences on, on inflation. So given that there are both demand and supply side influences, how do we think about the effectiveness of monetary policy in that environment? This is a question that used to come up when we were first thinking about what the appropriate monetary policy regime was. And the fact that you can have supply shocks that happen and then dissipate quite quickly uh, was one of the reasons why we have a flexible in inflation targeting regime. Uh, it's the reason, you know, there are just certain things you cannot offset and probably don't really want to offset. So what's important from the perspective of monetary policy and what the board's trying to do at the moment is to ensure that when these current supply shocks have washed through, 
that inflation does in fact go back into the target uh, zone between two and three percent expeditiously. Uh, because demand is so strong at the moment, we can't guarantee that without the policy response that um, the board is enacting. So, so thanks, Lucy. We might call questions to an end there, but we're so grateful for your participation. Um, and maybe you have some, some words of, um, of encouragement for this cohort of 2022. Thanks, Jackie. Yes, I do. So I'm really glad that everyone uh, could participate. And I do hope you got something out of it. I'm sure you did, because uh, I, I know John would have uh, given a fantastic presentation. And, you know, I, I say that really conscious of the fact that the last couple of years have been really disrupted. Uh, this year, we've had no lockdowns, but, you know, there are you know, certainly lingering effects from the um, what we've all been through over the last two years. And, and I think of, you know, the effect of school closures uh, on, on people's learning. I mean, that will be something that people will want to research looking at different countries. There'll be, you know, no doubt the pandemic will cause, you know, result in all sorts of, you know, fascinating research about the impact. But, um, you know, the very human effect of that was the, the disruption to our daily lives because of the pandemic and the lockdowns uh, can't be understated. Uh, but, you know, we're really happy to do uh, we in the Reserve Bank are really happy to do what we can to support your studies and 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 to perhaps undo some you know any of the deleterious effects that have happened because of the pandemic. But what the pandemic and some other recent events does show is the value of an economic way of thinking. I mean, it's true that a virus uh, or a, an invasion of another country of, of a country, they're, they're factors that in some sense start from outside the economic system. You know, we're not epidemiologists, we're not military strategists, and yet we have to work out what the implications of those events are. And I will say that, you know, having been the chief economist through the events that we're currently going through, uh, and you know, having to have a lot of humility about our ability to predict uh, how some of those extra economic events might play out, Understanding the consequences of those events is very much something that needs an economic way of thinking. I mean, think about how people do adapt and respond to lockdowns, how they change their business models, how they change their employment decisions, how they change their spending decisions. Uh, you know, is, re is revenge consumption a thing? These are all economic questions that have come out of the pandemic. And similarly, uh, following the, you know, the, the tragic and illegal of invasion by Russia of Ukraine, you know, there is a question about you know, right around the world about how people are going to respond to the resulting higher energy prices. Uh, do people reduce their consumption of energy? How does that play out in the economy? Does this mean we move to a faster rate of decarbonisation uh, and dealing with climate change than we otherwise would have? These are all economic questions. Uh, and so Whatever you choose to do with your economic studies after this year, uh, wherever you choose to take that. Now, I hope you go on to study economics, uh, but I recognize not everyone will. Uh, I hope you do, whatever you do with it, I do hope you take with you a lasting appreciation of what economics thinking is all about. Yes, it's very quantitative. And yes, quantitative reasoning skills are very desirable in the workforce nowadays. Uh, but it's more than that. It, in the end, economics is about people. It's about understanding people and how they behave in certain domains of life. Uh, and personally, I think that's one of the most fascinating questions we can ask about our world. Uh, and economics provides one of the most powerful sets of tools for thinking about those questions and how we can make the world better for all people. So I want to thank you again uh, for your attendance and your attention today. I hope you got a lot out of it. Uh, I wish you all the best for your studies. Um, I recognise there's probably quite a lot of work ahead of you in terms of you know, the, re the remaining couple of terms and studying for exams. And so I, I wish you all the best with that. And uh, thank you very much for being on this webinar. Thanks so much, Lucy, and thanks so much to uh, John and Lucy for, for their, their thoughts and, and insights and, and uh, the presentation. But most importantly, I want to thank all the, the students and educators who've joined us today and good luck um, for your exams.